Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. With Abigail Thor and Deborah Findlay, Robert Bathurst, Tim McInerney and Helena Wilson. And introducing Flora Anderson. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. For having lived in Westminster... How many years now? Over 20. One feels Clarissa was positive an indescribable pause before Big Ben strikes, even in the midst of the traffic or waking at night, a particular hush or solemnity an indescribable pause, a suspense. But that might be her heart, affected, they said, by influenza. There, out it boomed. First a warning, musical, then the hour, irrevocable. Such fools we are, she thought, crossing Victoria Street. For heaven only knows why one loves it so, how one sees it so, making it up, building it round one, tumbling, creating every moment afresh. The most dejected of miseries sitting on doorsteps. Drink their downfall. Do the same. Can't be dealt with, she felt positive, by acts of Parliament. For that very reason, they love life. The bellow and the uproar, the swing, tramp and trudge, carriages, motor cars, omnibuses, the look in people's eyes, the triumph and the jingle and the strange high singing of some aeroplane overhead was what she loved. Life, London, this moment of June. For it was the middle of June. The war was over. Except for someone like Mrs Foxcroft at the embassy last night, her heart out, because that nice boy was killed and now the old manor house must go to a cousin. Or Lady Bexborough, John, her favourite, gone who opened a bazaar, they said, with a telegram in her hand. But it was over, thank heaven, over. It was June. The king and queen were at the palace, and everywhere there was a beating, a stirring of galloping ponies, tapping of cricket bats, lords, ascot, and all the rest of it, wrapped in the soft mesh of grey-blue morning air. The whirling young men and laughing girls, who even now, after dancing all night, were taking their absurd woolly dogs for a run. And even now, at this hour, discreet old dowagers were shooting out in their motor cars on errands of mystery, and shopkeepers were fidgeting in their windows with their lovely brooches in old settings to tempt Americans. But one must economise, not buy things rashly for Elizabeth. And she, too, loving it as she did with an absurd and faithful passion, she, too, was going that very night to kindle and illuminate, to give her party. But how strange, on entering the park, the silence, the mist, the hum, the slow-swimming happy ducks, the pouched birds waddling, and who should be coming along most appropriately with his back against the government buildings, carrying a dispatch box with the royal arms, who but Hugh Whitbread, her old friend, the admirable Hugh. I love walking in London, said Mrs Dalloway. Really, it's better than walking in the country. They'd just come up, unfortunately, to see doctors. Other people came to see pictures, the opera, the Whitbreads to see doctors. Times without number, Clarissa had visited Evelyn Whitbread in a nursing home. Was Evelyn ill again? A good deal out of sorts, said Hugh, intimated by a kind of swell of his perfectly upholstered manly body. He was almost too well-dressed, but presumably had to be with his job at court. That his wife had some internal ailment, nothing serious, which, as an old friend, Clarissa Dalloway would quite understand, without requiring him to specify. She did, of course, and felt very sisterly, and at the same time oddly conscious of her hat. Not the right hat for the early morning, was that it? For Hugh always made her feel as he bustled on, raising his hat rather extravagantly, and assuring her that she might be a girl of eighteen. And of course he was coming to her party tonight. Evelyn absolutely insisted, only a little late he might be after the party at the palace. She always felt a little skimpy beside Hugh, schoolgirlish. But attached to him, partly from having known him always. And she did think him a good sort in his own way. Though Richard was nearly driven mad by him. And as for Peter Walsh, he had never to this day forgiven her for liking him. She could remember scene after scene at Borton. Peter furious. Hugh not, of course, his match in any way. But still not a positive imbecile as Peter made out, not a mere barber's block. When his old mother wanted him to give up shooting or to take her to Bath, he did it without a word. He was really unselfish. And as for saying, as Peter did, that he had no heart, no brain, nothing but the manners and reading of an English gentleman. That was only her dear Peter at his worst, and he could be intolerable. He could be impossible, but adorable to walk with on a morning like this. Yet Peter, however beautiful the day might be, and the trees and the grass and the little girl in pink, Peter never saw a thing of all that. If she told him to, he would look. If she told him twice, he would put on his spectacles. It was the state of the world that interested him. Wagner, Pope's poetry, people's characters eternally, and the defects of her own soul, how he scolded her, how they argued. She would marry a prime minister and stand at the top of a staircase, the perfect hostess, he called her. 
She had cried over it in her bedroom. He had said she had the makings of the perfect hostess. They might be parted for hundreds of years, she and Peter. She never wrote a letter. And his would dry sticks. But suddenly it would come over her. If he were with me now, what would he say? She had been right. She had, too, not to marry him. For in marriage a little license, there must be a little independence between people living together day in, day out in the same house, which Richard gave her and she him. Where was he this morning, for instance, some committee? She never asked what. But with Peter, everything had to be shared, everything gone into, and it was intolerable. And when it came to that scene in the little garden by the fountain, she had to break with him or they would have been destroyed, both of them ruined. She was convinced, though she had borne for years like an arrow sticking in her heart, the grief, the anguish. And then the horror of the moment when someone told her at a concert that he had married a woman met on the boat to India. Never should she forget all that. Never could she understand how he cared. But those Anglo-Indian women did, presumably, silly, flimsy individuals, and she wasted her pity, for he was quite happy, he had assured her, perfectly happy. Though he had never done a thing that they talked of, his whole life had been a failure. It made her angry still. She had reached the park gates. She stood for a moment, looking at the omnibuses in Piccadilly. Only now did the abominable Hugh remember he had forgotten to tell her Peter Walsh was in town. She would not say of anyone in the world now that they were this or they were that. She felt very young. At the same time unspeakably aged. She sliced like a knife through everything. At the same time was outside looking on. She had a perpetual sense as she watched the taxi cabs. Of being out, out, far out to sea and alone. She had always had the feeling that it was very, very dangerous to live even one day. Not that she thought herself clever or much out of the ordinary. How she had got through life on the few twigs of knowledge Fräulein Daniels gave them, she could not think. She knew nothing, no language, no history. She scarcely read a book now except memoirs in bed. And yet to her it was absolutely absorbing, all this, the cabs passing, and she would not say of Peter, she would not say of herself, I am this, I am that. Her only gift was knowing people almost by instinct. If you put her in a room with someone, either up went her back like a cat's, or she purred. Devonshire House, Bath House, the house with the china cockatoo, she had seen them all lit up once. Did it matter then, walking towards Bond Street, did it matter that she must inevitably cease completely? All this must go on without her. Did she resent it, or did it not become consoling to believe that death ended absolutely? But that somehow in the streets of London, the ebb and flow of things here, there, she survived, Peter survived, lived in each other, she being part, she was positive, of the trees at home, of the house there, part of people she had never met, being laid out like a mist between the people she knew best, who lifted her on their branches as she had seen the trees lift the mist. It spread ever so far. Her life, herself. What was she dreaming as she looked into Hatchard's shop window? This late age of the world's experience had bred in them all, men and women, a well of tears, tears and sorrows, courage and endurance, a perfectly upright and stoical bearing. Think of the woman she admired most, Lady Bexborough, opening the bazaar. Ever so many books there were, but none seemed right to take to Evelyn, nothing that would amuse her and make her, just for a moment, cordial. Before they settled down for the interminable talk of women's ailments. How much she wanted it, that people should look pleased with her, pleased as she came in. Half the time she did things not for themselves, but to make people think this or that. Much rather to have been one of those people like Richard who did things for themselves. It was silly to have other reasons for doing things, perfect idiocy for no one was for a second taken in. Oh, if she could have her life over again. She could have even looked different. She had the oddest sense of being herself invisible, unseen, unknown. There being no more marrying, no more having of children, but only this astonishing and rather solemn progress with the rest of them, up Bond Street, this being Mrs. Dalloway. Not even Clarissa anymore. This being Mrs. Richard Dalloway. The hall of the house was cool as a vault. Not for a moment did she believe in God. But all the more, she thought, must one repay in daily life to servants. Yes, to dogs and canaries, above all to Richard, her husband. One must pay back from this secret deposit of exquisite moments. Clarissa read on the telephone pad, Lady Bruton wishes to know if Mr. Dalloway will lunch with her today. And Lucy told her that Mr. Dalloway would be lunching out. Dear, said Clarissa. And Lucy shared, as she meant her to, her disappointment. But not the pang. Fear no more, said Clarissa. Fear no more the heat of the sun. For the shock of Lady Bruton asking Richard to lunch without her made the moment in which she stood shiver. Millicent Bruton, whose lunch parties were said to be extraordinarily amusing, had not asked her. She feared time itself, the dwindling of life, how year by year her share was sliced, how little the margin that remained was capable any longer of stretching, of absorbing, as in the youthful years, the colours, salts, tones of existence. She began to go slowly upstairs, feeling herself suddenly shriveled, aged, breastless, out of her body and brain which now failed since she had not been asked. There was an emptiness about the heart of life, an attic room, 
The sheets were clean, tight, stretched in a broad white band from side to side. Narrower and narrower would her bed be. The candle was half burnt down. She had read late at night from Baron Marbo, for the house sat so long that Richard insisted after her illness she must sleep undisturbed. And really she preferred to read of the retreat from Moscow. He knew it. So the room was an attic, the bed narrow, and lying there reading, for she slept badly. She could not dispel a virginity preserved through childbirth, which clung to her like a sheet, lovely in girlhood. Suddenly there came a moment, for example on the river beneath the woods at Clifton, when through some contraction of this cold spirit she had failed him. And then at Constantinople. And again and again. She could see what she lacked. It was not beauty. It was not mind. It was something central which permeated, something warm which broke up surfaces and rippled the cold contact of man and woman, or of women together. For that she could dimly perceive. She resented it, a scruple picked up heaven knows where, or, as she felt, sent by nature. Who is invariably wise. Yet she could not resist sometimes yielding to the charm of a woman, not a girl, of a woman confessing, as to her they often did, some scrape or folly, and whether it was pity or their beauty or that she was older or some accident, like a faint scent or a violin next door. So strange is the power of sounds at certain moments. She did undoubtedly then feel what men felt, only for a moment, but it was enough. Against such moments contrasted the bed and Baron Marbo and the candle half burnt. But this question of love, this falling in love with women, take Sally Seaton. The old days with Sally Seaton. Had not that, after all, been love? Sat on the floor, that was her first impression of Sally, sat on the floor with her arms round her knees, smoking a cigarette. Where could it have been? The Mannings? The Kinlock Joneses? At some party. For she had a distinct recollection of saying to the man she was with, Tingling all over, Who is she? And he had told her, and said that Sally's parents did not get on. How that shocked her, that one's parents should quarrel. But all that evening she could not take her eyes off Sally. It was an extraordinary beauty of the kind she most admired. Dark, large-eyed, with a quality which, since she hadn't got it herself, she always envied. A sort of abandonment, as if she could say anything, do anything. A quality uncommon in English women. She always said she had French blood. An ancestor had been with Marie Antoinette, had his head cut off, left a ruby ring. They sat up till all hours of the night, talking. Sally, it was, who made her feel for the first time how sheltered life at Borton was. She knew nothing about social problems, nothing about sex. She had once seen an old man who had dropped dead in a field. She had seen cows just after their calves were worn. But Aunt Helena never liked discussion of anything. When Sally gave her William Morris, it had to be wrapped in brown paper. There they sat, hour after hour, talking in her bedroom at the top of the house, talking about life, how they were to reform the world. They meant to found a society to abolish private property and actually had a letter written. Though not sent out. The ideas were Sally's, of course. But very soon she was just as excited. Read Plato in bed before breakfast, Morris, Shelley by the hour... Sally's power was amazing, her gift, her personality. There was her way with flowers. At Burton they always had stiff little vases all the way down the table. Sally went out, picked hollyhocks, dahlias. All sorts of flowers that had never been seen together, cut their heads off and made them swim on the top of water in bowls. The effect was extraordinary coming in to dinner in the sunset. Of course Aunt Helena thought it wicked to treat flowers like that. Then she forgot her sponge and ran along the passage naked. That grim old housemaid, Ellen Atkins, went about grumbling. Suppose any of the gentlemen had seen. Sally did shock people. She was untidy, Papa said. The strange thing on looking back was the purity, the integrity of her feeling for Sally. It was not like one's feeling for a man. It had a quality which could only exist between women, between women just grown up. It sprang from a sense of being in league together, a presentiment of something that was bound to part them. They spoke of marriage always as a catastrophe, which led to this chivalry, this protective feeling which was much more on her side. For in those days Sally was completely reckless, did the most idiotic things out of bravado, bicycled round the parapet on the terrace, smoked cigars. Absurd she was. Very absurd. She could remember standing in her bedroom at the top of the house, holding the hot water can in her hands and saying aloud, She is beneath this roof. No, the words meant absolutely nothing to her now. She could not even get an echo of her old emotion, but she could remember going cold with excitement. Doing her hair in a kind of ecstasy, the old feeling began to come back as she took out her hairpins, laid them on the dressing table, that feeling after dressing and going downstairs, and as she crossed the hall, if it were now to die, it were now to be most happy, all because she was coming down to dinner in a white frock to meet Sally Seaton, who was wearing pink gauze. Was that possible? She seemed anyhow all light, glowing like some flown-in bird. But nothing is so strange. 
Nothing is so strange as the complete indifference of other people. Nothing is so strange when one is in love. Aunt Helena just wandered off after dinner. Papa read the paper. Peter Walsh might have been there, and old Miss Cummings. Poor Joseph Breitkopf came every summer. All this was only a background for Sally. She stood by the fireplace talking. That extraordinary voice. That intoxicating caress. She stood talking to Papa, who rather against his will was becoming attracted. He never got over lending her one of his books and finding it soaked on the terrace. Then suddenly she said, What a shame to sit indoors. And they all went out and walked up and down. Peter and Joseph went on about Wagner. She and Sally fell a little behind. Then came the most exquisite moment of her whole life, passing a stone urn with flowers in it. Sally stopped, picked a flower, kissed her on the lips. The whole world might have turned upside down. The others disappeared. There she was alone with Sally, and she felt that she'd been given a present wrapped up and told just to keep it, not to look at it. A diamond, something infinitely precious, wrapped up, which as they walked she uncovered. The radiance burnt through, the revelation, the religious feeling. Then old Joseph and Peter faced them. Stargazing, said Peter. It was like running one's face against a granite wall in the darkness. It was shocking. It was horrible. Not for herself. She felt only how Sally was being mauled already, maltreated. She felt his hostility, his jealousy, his determination to break into their companionship. Oh, this horror, she had said to herself, as if she had known all along that something would interrupt, would embitter her moment of happiness. Yet, after all, how much she owed him later. Always when she thought of him, she thought of their quarrels for some reason. Perhaps because she wanted his good opinion so much. She owed him words, sentimental, civilised. They started up every day of her life as if he guarded her. A book was sentimental, an attitude to life. Sentimental. Perhaps she was, to be thinking of the past. What would he think, she wondered, if he saw her now? That she had grown older. Would he say that, or would she see him thinking it, that she had grown older? It was true. Since her illness, she had turned almost white. Laying her brooch on the table, she had a sudden spasm, as if, while she mused, the icy claws had had the chance to fix in her. She was not old yet. She had just broken into her fifty-second year. Months and months of it were still untouched. June, July, August. She looked into the glass, seeing the delicate pink face of the woman who was that very night to give a party, of Clarissa Dalloway, of herself. How many million times had she seen her face? And always with the same imperceptible contraction. She pursed her lips when she looked in the glass. It was to give her face point. That was herself, pointed, dart-like, definite. That was herself when some effort, some call on her to be herself, drew the parts together. She had tried to be the same always, never showing a sign of all the other sides of her. Faults, jealousies, vanities, suspicions, like this of Lady Bruton not asking her to lunch. Which is utterly base. Now, where was her dress? Her evening dresses hung in the cupboard. Clarissa, plunging her hand into the softness, gently detached the green dress and carried it to the window. Someone had trod on the skirts at the embassy party. It had torn. She would mend it. Her maids had too much to do. She would wear it tonight. Strange, she thought, pausing on the landing, how her mistress knows the very moment, the very temper of her house. Faint sounds rose in spirals up the stairs, the swish of a mop, the clink of silver on a tray. All was for the party. Oh, Lucy, she said, the silver does look nice. And Lucy stopped at the drawing room door and said, very shyly, turning a little pink, couldn't she help to mend that dress? But, said Mrs. Dalloway, she had enough on her hands already. Quite enough of her own without that. But thank you, Lucy, oh, thank you. And she went on saying it in gratitude to her servants generally, for helping her to be like this, to be what she wanted. Gentle, generous-hearted, her servants liked her. This was a favourite dress, one of Sally Parker's. She was a character, thought Clarissa. An artist. She thought of little out-of-the-way things. Yet her dresses were never queer. You could wear them at Hatfield, at Buckingham Palace. She had worn them at Hatfield, at the palace. Quiet descended on her, calm, content as her needle drawing the silk smoothly to its gentle paws, collected the green folds together and attached them very lightly to the belt. Heavens, the front doorbell. After five years in India, Peter Wall stood in Clarissa's hallway. Mrs Dalloway heard a step on the stairs. It was outrageous to be interrupted at eleven o'clock in the morning of her party. The brass knob slipped. The door opened. For a single second she could not remember his name. So surprised she was to see him. So glad, so shy, so utterly taken aback to have Peter Walsh come to her unexpectedly in the morning. She had not read his letter. And how are you? said Peter, positively trembling. Taking both her hands, kissing both her hands. She's grown older. I shan't tell her anything about it. She's looking at me, he thought, a sudden embarrassment coming over him. Putting his hand into his pocket, he took out a large pocket knife and half opened the blade. Exactly the same. The same queer look. The same check suit. A little thinner, drier perhaps, 
but he looks awfully well and just the same. How heavenly it is to see you again. He had his knife out. That's so like him. And what's all this? He said, tilting his penknife towards her green dress. He's very well dressed, yet he always criticises me. Here she is, mending her dress as usual. She's been here all the time I've been in India. Mending her dress, playing about, going to parties, running to the house and back and all that. There's nothing in the world so bad for some women as marriage. So it is. And a conservative husband. So it is, and he shut his knife with a snap. And she opened her scissors and said, did he mind her just finishing what she was doing to her dress, for they had a party that night? Which I shan't ask you to, my dear Peter. But it was delicious to hear her say that, my dear Peter. Indeed, it was all, the silver, the chairs, all so delicious. Of course he's enchanting, perfectly enchanting. How impossible it was ever to make up my mind. And why did I make up my mind not to marry him? That awful summer. But it's so extraordinary that you should have come this morning. Do you remember how the blinds used to flap at Burton? They did, he said, and he remembered breakfasting alone very awkwardly with old Julian Parry. I often wish I'd got on better with your father. But he never liked anyone who... Our friends, said Clarissa. And she could have bitten her tongue off for thus reminding him he had wanted to marry her. Of course I did, he thought. It almost broke my heart, too. I was more unhappy than I'd ever been since. Herbert has it now. I never go there now. Why make him think of it again? Why go back like this to the past? Do you remember the lake? Yes. He said yes, but he wanted to cry stop. For he was not old. He was only just past fifty. His life was not by any means over. Shall I tell her? Daisy would look ordinary beside Clarissa. She would think me a failure, which I am, in the Dalloway's sense. Oh, yes, there was no doubt about that. He was a failure, compared with all this. The inlaid table, the candlesticks, and the valuable prints. He took out his knife and clenched his fist upon it. Quite openly. What an extraordinary habit that was, always playing with a knife. Always making one feel frivolous, empty-minded, a mere chatterbox. Peter Walsh and Clarissa Dalloway, sitting side by side on the blue sofa, challenged each other. Well, and what's happened to you? Millions of things. Clarissa sat very upright, drew in her breath. I'm in love, in love with a girl in India. In love, she said, that he at his age should be sucked under in his little bow tie by that monster. And there's no flesh on his neck. His hands are red. And he's six months older than I. Her dear Peter. That indomitable egotism charged her cheeks with colour. Made her look very young. He was in love. Not with her. With some younger woman, of course. And who is she? A married woman, unfortunately. The wife of a major in the Indian army. He smiled as he placed Daisy in this way before Clarissa. She has two small children, a boy and a girl. And I've come over to see my lawyers about the divorce. What a folly. What a waste. All his life long, Peter had been fooled like that. First getting sent down from Oxford, next marrying the girl on the boat to India. Now the wife of a major in the Indian army. Thank heaven she had refused to marry him. Still, he was in love. But what are you going to do? Uh, Lawyers and solicitors, Messrs Hooper and Greatly of Lincoln's Inn. And he actually pared his nails with his pocket knife. For heaven's sake, leave the knife alone. It was his silly unconventionality, his weakness, his lack of the ghost of a notion what anyone else was feeling. And now at his age... I know all that, he thought. I know what I'm up against, running his finger along the blade of his knife. Clarissa and Dalloway and all the rest of them. But I'll show Clarissa. And then to his utter surprise, thrown suddenly by those uncontrollable forces in the air, he burst into tears. Wept. Wept without the least shame, sitting on the sofa, the tears running down his cheeks. And Clarissa had leant forward, taken his hand, drawn him to her, kissed him. Had actually felt his face on hers, plumes like pampas grass in a tropic gale in her breast. Which, subsiding, left her holding his hand, patting his knee, and feeling as she sat back extraordinarily at ease with him, and light-hearted, all in a clap it came over her. If I had married him, this gaiety would have been mine all day. It was all over for her. The sheet was stretched and the bed narrow. She had gone up into the tower alone and left them blackberrying in the sun. What had she made of her life? What indeed? Peter had got up and crossed to the window, and stood with his back to her, flicking her handkerchief from side to side. Masterly and dry and desolate he looked, his thin shoulder blades lifting his coat slightly. Take me with you, Clarissa thought impulsively, as if he were starting upon some great voyage, and then next moment... It was as if the five acts of a play that had been very exciting and moving were now over, and she had lived a lifetime in them, and had run away, lived with Peter, and it was now over. And it was awfully strange, he thought, how she still had the power, as she came tinkling across the room, to make the moon... Which he detested. ...rise at Borton on the terrace in the summer sky. He seized her by the shoulders. Tell me, are you happy, Clarissa? Does Richard... The door opened. Here is my Elizabeth. The sound of Big Ben striking the half-hour struck out between them with extraordinary vigour. As if a young man, strong, indifferent, inconsiderate, was swinging dumbbells this way and that. Hello, Elizabeth. Goodbye, Clarissa. Clarissa followed Peter Walsh out onto the landing, calling his name, reminding him to remember her party tonight, 
raising her voice against the roar of the open air. He stepped down the street, speaking to himself rhythmically, repeating the words, Remember my party. Why does she give these parties? Not that he blamed her or this effigy of a man coming towards him in a tailcoat with a carnation in his buttonhole. Clarissa had grown hard, he thought, and a trifle sentimental into the bargain. The way she said, here is my Elizabeth, that annoyed him. Why not here's Elizabeth simply? It was insincere, and Elizabeth didn't like it either. He understood young people. There was always something cold in Clarissa, he thought. She had always, even as a girl, a sort of timidity, which in middle age becomes conventionality, and then it's all up. Then it's all up. He wondered whether by calling her at that hour he had annoyed her. He had been a fool. It was shameful, being emotional, weeping, telling her everything. As usual. As usual. He stood there thinking. Clarissa refused me. Clarissa refused me. Feeling hollowed out, utterly empty within. Ah, said the sound of St. Margaret's, like a hostess who comes into her drawing room on the very stroke of the hour and finds her guests already there. Like Clarissa herself coming down the stairs in white. It is Clarissa herself, he thought, with a deep emotion and an extraordinarily clear yet puzzling recollection of her. As if this bell had come into the room years ago where they sat at some moment of great intimacy. But what room? What moment? And why had he been so profoundly happy when the clock was striking? Then, as the sound of St. Margaret's languished, he thought, She has been ill, and the sound expressed languor and suffering. It was her heart, he remembered. And the sudden loudness of the final stroke told for death in the midst of life that surprised, and he saw Clarissa falling where she stood in her drawing room. No, no. She is not dead. I am not old. And he marched up Whitehall as if there rolled down to him vigorous, unending his future. He was not old, or set, or dried in the least. He cared not a straw what their set said of him. He had been sent down from Oxford. True. He had been a socialist, in some sense a failure. True, but the future of civilization lies in the hands of young men like that. Young men with the love of abstract principles. Boys in uniform carrying guns marched up Whitehall with their eyes ahead of them. It is, thought Peter, beginning to keep step with them, a very fine training. But they did not look robust. They were weedy for the most part. Boys of sixteen. But they had taken their vow. The traffic respected it. Vans were stopped. I can't keep up with them, Peter Walsh thought, as they marched up Whitehall. And sure enough, in their steady way, as if one uniform will worked all their legs and arms, on past him they marched. One had to respect it. One might laugh, but one had to respect it. He could respect it in boys. They don't know the troubles of the flesh yet, all I've been through. The marching boys disappeared in the direction of the Strand. He crossed the road and stood under General Gordon's statue. George Gordon, who I worshipped as a boy. Chinese Gordon, standing lonely with one leg raised and his arms crossed. Poor Gordon. The strangeness of standing alone, alive, at half past eleven on Trafalgar Square overcame him. He had not felt so young in years. But she's extraordinarily attractive. Walking across Trafalgar Square in the direction of the Haymarket came a young woman. Who seemed... Susceptible as he was. To shed veil after veil. Until she became the very woman he had always had in mind. Young but stately, merry but discreet, dark but enchanting. Straightening himself and fingering his pocket knife, he started to follow this woman. You, she said. You, saying it with her white gloves and her shoulders. But she's not married. She's young, quite young. There was a dignity about her. She was not worldly. Like Clarissa. Not rich. Like Clarissa. Was she respectable? Let's say witty, with a lizard's flickering tongue, a cool waiting wit, darting, not noisy. She moved. She crossed. He followed her. To embarrass her was the last thing he wished. Still, if she stopped, he would say, come and have a nice. And she would answer perfectly simply, oh yes. But other people got between them in the street, obstructing him, blotting her out. He pursued... She changed. There was colour in her cheeks, mockery in her eyes. He was an adventurer, reckless, swift, daring, a romantic buccaneer. On and on she went, across Piccadilly and up Regent Street, then she turned down one of the little streets. With one look in his direction, but not at him, one look that bade farewell, summing up the whole situation and dismissing it triumphantly forever, she fitted her key, opened the door and was gone. Well, I've had my fun. It was over. It was half made up, invented, this escapade with the girl. Made up as one makes up the better part of life. Making oneself up, making her up, creating an exquisite amusement. And something more. He turned, went up the street, thinking to find somewhere to sit. Regent's Park, yes. As a child, he had walked in Regent's Park. Odd how the thought of childhood keeps coming back. The result of seeing Clarissa, perhaps, for women live so much more in the past. He sat, feeling a little drowsy as he did. He did not want to be bothered. She's a queer-looking girl, he thought, suddenly remembering Elizabeth, grown big, quite grown up, not exactly pretty, handsome and she can't be more than 18. Probably she doesn't get on with Clarissa. Why not? Here's Elizabeth, simply, trying to make out, like most mothers, that things are what they're not. She trusts her charm too much. Suddenly he closed his eyes. A great brush swept across his mind, sweeping across it children's voices, the shuffle of feet of passing people, the rising, falling, humming traffic. Down he sank into the plumes of sleep. Peter Walsh began snoring. By conviction an atheist, he is taken by surprise by moments of extraordinary exaltation. Nothing exists outside us except a state of mind, he thinks. 
a desire for solace, for relief, for something outside these miserable pygmies, these feeble, ugly, craven men and women. But if he can conceive of her, then in some sort she exists. Such are the visions which proffer. Such are the visions which ceaselessly float up. Such are the visions. If others can see it as I have seen it, then it may be called a vision rather than a dream. But once the realisation is accepted that even between the closest people, infinite distances exist, a marvellous living side by side can flourish for them, if they succeed in loving the expanse between them, which gives them the possibility of always seeing each other as a whole before an immense sky. If others can see it as I have seen it, then it may be called a vision rather than a dream. He woke with extreme suddenness, saying to himself, the death of the soul. Lord, Lord, the death of the soul. The words attached themselves to some past he had been dreaming of. It was at Borton that summer, early in the 90s, when he was so passionately in love with Clarissa. There were a great many people there, laughing and talking. The room was bathed in yellow light and full of cigarette smoke. They were talking about a neighbouring squire who had married his housemaid, a housemaid, and she had been brought to Borton to call. An awful visit it had been. She was absurdly overdressed. Like a cockatoo. On and on Clarissa had went, imitating her. And Sally. A bold thing to say. Does it make any real difference to know she had had a baby before they married? He could see Clarissa now turning bright pink, somehow contracting. Oh, I shall never be able to speak to her again. Whereupon the tea table seemed to wobble. The whole assembled party seemed to wobble. He hadn't blamed her for minding. She was a girl brought up as she was. But her manner annoyed him. Timid, hard, somehow arrogant. She was unimaginative and prudish. He had ticketed the moment, the death of her soul. Then Clarissa got up, made some excuse, went off. As she opened the door, in came that great shaggy dog which ran after sheep. She flung herself upon him, went into raptures. It was all aimed at him. It was as if to say... I know you thought me absurd about that woman, but see how extraordinarily sympathetic I am. See how I love my Rob. They had always this queer power of communicating without words. She knew he had criticised her. Then she would do something quite obvious to defend herself. It never took him in. He always saw through. Not that he said anything, of course. Just sat looking glum. It was the way the quarrels often began. At once he had become extremely depressed. It all seemed useless, going on being in love, going on quarrelling, going on making it up. And he wandered off among outhouses, stables, looking at the horses. She'd go on as if nothing had happened. That was the devilish part of her, this coldness, woodenness, something very profound in her. He had felt it again this morning, an impenetrability. Yet heaven knows he loved her. She had some queer power of fiddling on one's nerves. Turning one's nerves to fiddle strings. And then halfway through dinner that evening, he made himself look across at Clarissa for the first time. She was talking to a young man on her right. He had a sudden revelation. She will marry that man. For it was that afternoon, that very afternoon, that Dalloway had come over. And Clarissa called him Wickham. That was the beginning of it all. Somebody had brought him over and Clarissa got his name wrong. She introduced him to everybody as Wickham. At last he said, my name is Dalloway. That was his first view of Richard, a fair young man, rather awkward, sitting on a deck chair. Sally got hold of it. Always after that she called him, my name is Dalloway. He was a prey to revelations at that time. This one, that she would marry Dalloway, was blinding, overwhelming. There was a sort of, a sort of ease in her manner to him, something maternal, gentle. They were talking about politics. All through dinner he tried to hear what they were saying. Afterwards Clarissa came up with her perfect manners like a real hostess and wanted to introduce him to someone. Spoke to Peter as if they had never before met, utterly enraging. Yet even then he admired her for it, her courage, her social instinct, her power of carrying things through. He said to her, The perfect hostess. Whereupon she winced all over. He meant her to feel it. He would have done anything to hurt her after seeing her with Dalloway. So she left him. And he had a feeling that they were all gathered together in a conspiracy against him, laughing and talking behind his back. He heard them talking about fetching cloaks. They were going boating on the lake by moonlight, one of Sally's ideas. They all went out. He was left quite alone. Don't you want to go with them? said Aunt Helena. She had guessed. And he turned round and there was Clarissa again. He was overcome by her goodness. Come along. They're waiting. He had never felt so happy in his whole life. Without a word, they made it up. He had twenty minutes of perfect happiness. Her voice, her dress, her adventurousness. She made them all disembark and explore the island. She startled a hen. She laughed. She sang. And all the time, he knew perfectly well, Dalloway was falling in love with her. She was falling in love with Dalloway. 
It didn't seem to matter. They sat on the ground and talked, he and Clarissa. They went in and out of each other's minds without any effort. And then in a second it was over. He said to himself as they were getting into the boat, She will marry that man, without resentment. It was an obvious thing. Dalloway would marry Clarissa. Dalloway rode them in. He said nothing. But somehow as they watched him jumping onto his bicycle to ride twenty miles through the woods, waving his hand, disappearing. He obviously did feel instinctively, tremendously, strongly, all that. The night, the romance, Clarissa. He deserved to have her. While I was absurd, the demands upon Clarissa... He could see it now. ...were absurd. He asked impossible things. He made terrible scenes. She would have accepted him still, perhaps, if he had been less absurd. Sally thought so. It was an extraordinary summer. All letters, scenes, telegrams. Clarissa in bed with headaches. The final terrible scene which he believed had mattered more than anything in the whole of his life. It might be an exaggeration, but still it did seem so now. Happened at three o'clock in the afternoon of a very hot day. Sally was saying something about Dalloway, calling him, My name is Dalloway. Whereupon Clarissa suddenly stiffened and rapped out sharply. We've had enough of that feeble joke. That was all. But for him it was precisely as if she had said, I'm only amusing myself with you. I have an understanding with Richard Dalloway. He had not slept for nights. It had to be finished one way or another. He sent a note by Sally asking to meet by the fountain at three. Something very important has happened, it had read. The fountain was far from the house. Tell me the truth, tell me the truth, he kept on saying. She seemed contracted, petrified. She did not move. Tell me the truth. She was unyielding. He felt that he was grinding against something physically hard. After he had spoken... For hours, it seemed, with tears running down his cheeks. She said, It's no use. It's no use. This is the end. It was as if she had hit him in the face. She turned, she left him, went away. She never came back. He called after her. Calling her name. It was over. He went away that night. He never saw her again. We are all islands, shouting lies to each other, across seas of misunderstanding. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Clarissa always said that Lady Bruton did not like her. Lady Bruton preferred Richard Dalloway, of course, who arrived next moment on her doorstep. But she wouldn't let them run down her poor dear Hugh. She could never forget his kindness. She forgot precisely the occasion. But he had been remarkably kind. Anyhow, the difference between one man and another does not amount to much. There was nobody else coming, she said. She had got them there on false pretenses to help her out of a difficulty. Lady Bruton had the reputation of being more interested in politics than people. Thus, when she said in her offhand way, How's Clarissa? Husbands had difficulty persuading their wives, and indeed themselves, of her interest in the women who often got in their way, prevented them from accepting posts abroad, and had to be taken to the seaside in the middle of the session to recover from influenza. I met Clarissa in the park this morning, said Hugh Whitbread, diving into the casserole. Do you know who's in town? Our old friend Peter Walsh. They all smiled. Peter Walsh. And Mr Dalloway was genuinely glad. Well, Mr Whitbread thought only of his chicken. All three, Lady Bruton, Hugh Whitbread and Richard Dalloway, remembered the same thing. How passionately Peter had been in love, been rejected. Gone to India, come a cropper, made a mess of things. Richard Dalloway was thinking that Peter Walsh had been in love with Clarissa. And Richard Dalloway had a very great liking for the dear old fellow too. Yes, Peter had been in love with Clarissa too. Richard was thinking he would go back directly after lunch and find Clarissa. That he would tell her in so many words that he loved her. Yes, he would say that. To never say what one feels is pitiable. Yes, Peter Walsh has come back, said Lady Bruton. But to help him, they reflected, was impossible. There was some flaw in his character. 
Hugh Whitbread said one might of course mention his name to so-and-so. It wouldn't lead to anything. In trouble with some woman, said Lady Bruton. They had all guessed that was at the bottom of it. The coffee was very slow in coming. The address, murmured Hugh Whitbread. Lady Bruton had to write her letter to the Times. And one letter, she used to say, cost her more than to organise an expedition to South Africa. She would turn gratefully to Hugh Whitbread, who possessed, no one could doubt it, the art of writing letters to the Times. Lady Bruton suspended judgment upon men in deference to the mysterious accord in which they stood to the laws of the universe. If they knew the done things, the right words. So if Richard advised her and Hugh wrote for her, she was sure of being somehow right. Richard said one must take risks. Hugh was slow. Hugh was assiduous. He began writing capital letters with rings round them in the margin. Thus marvellously reducing Lady Bruton's tangles to sense, to grammar such as the editor of the Times must respect, felt Lady Bruton watching the marvellous transformation. He read out phrases like, How therefore we are of opinion that the Times are ripe, the superfluous youth of our ever-increasing population. What we owe to the dead. Which Richard thought all stuffing and bosh, but no harm in it, of course. And Hugh went on drafting sentiments of the highest nobility, summing up now and then the progress they had made, until finally he read out the draft of a letter. Which Lady Bruton felt certain was a masterpiece. Could her own meaning sound like that? Hugh had married a lady, the Honourable Evelyn, and they lived hereabout, for he had lunched there once. The Whitbreads, he could hear Sally saying. Who are the Whitbreads? Coal merchants, respectable tradespeople. And now there they lived hereabouts, with their linen cupboards and their old masters and their pillowcases fringed with real lace, at the rate of five or ten thousand a year, while he, two years older, cadged for a job. Sally Seaton was the last person in the world one would have expected to marry a rich man and live in a large house near Manchester. The daring, wild, romantic Sally. Of all Clarissa's friends, she was probably the best. She tried to get hold of things by the right end. She saw through Hugh Whitbread, the admirable Hugh, when Clarissa and the rest were at his feet. She detested him for some reason. He's read nothing, thought nothing, felt nothing. That emphatic voice carried so much further than she knew. The stable boys have more life in them. No country but England could have produced him. She was really spiteful. There was some reason, some grudge. Something had happened, he forgot what, in the smoking room. He had insulted her, kissed her. Impossible. Nobody believed a word against Hugh. Who could? Kissing Sally in the smoking room? If it had been some Honourable Edith or Lady Violet, well, perhaps, but not that ragamuffin Sally without a penny to her name and a father or mother gambling at Monte Carlo. And now Sally was married to a rich man, and at 53 he had to ask for something that brought in 500 a year. For if he married Daisy, they could never do on less, even with his pension. Whitbread could, presumably, or Dalloway. He didn't mind what he asked Dalloway. He was a bit limited, a bit thick in the head, but a thorough good sort. Whatever he took up, he did in the same sensible way, without a spark of brilliancy, but with the inexplicable niceness of his type. He was wasted on politics, or to have been a country gentleman. How good he was, for instance, when that great shaggy dog of Clarissa's got caught in a trap and had its paw half torn off, and Clarissa turned faint, and Dalloway did the whole thing, bandaged, made splints, told Clarissa not to be a fool. All the time talking to the dog as if it were a human being. That was what she liked him for, perhaps. That was what she needed. But how could she swallow all that stuff about poetry? How could she let him hold forth about Shakespeare? Seriously and solemnly, Richard Dalloway got on his hind legs and said that no decent man should read the sonnets because it was like listening at keyholes. Incredible. The only thing to do was to pelt him with sugared almonds. But Clarissa sucked it all in, thought it so honest of him, so independent. Heaven knows if she didn't think him the most original mind she'd ever met. That was one of the bonds between Sally and himself. She implored him, half laughing, of course. Carry off, Clarissa. Save her from the Hughes and the Dalloways, all the other perfect gentlemen, who will stifle her soul, make a mere hostess of her. But one must do Clarissa justice. She wasn't going to marry Hugh. She had a perfectly clear notion of what she wanted. Her emotions were all on the surface. Beneath, she was very shrewd, a far better judge of character than Sally, purely feminine, with that extraordinary gift of making a world of her own wherever she happened to be. Sally was striking, beautiful but it was Clarissa one remembered. There was nothing picturesque about her. She never said anything specially clever, and yet there she was. There she was. Richard Dalloway and Hugh Whitbread hesitated at the corner of Conduit Street. In Norfolk, of which he was half thinking, a soft warm wind blew back the petals, arced the waters, ruffled the grasses. Hugh Whitbread admired condescendingly with airs of connoisseurship a Spanish necklace, which he thought of asking the price of. Evelyn Whitbread might like to buy this Spanish necklace. So she might. Hugh was going into the shop. Yawn, he must. Right you are, said Richard, following. Goodness knows he didn't want to go buying necklaces with you, but there are tides in the body. The worthlessness of this life did strike Richard pretty forcibly, buying necklaces for Evelyn. If he'd had a boy, he'd have said work. Work, 
But he had his Elizabeth. He adored his Elizabeth. I should like to see Monsieur Dubonnet, said Hugh in his curt worldly way. It appeared that this Dubonnet had the measurements of Mrs. Whitbread's neck, or, more strangely still, knew her views upon Spanish jewellery and the extent of her possessions in that line. Which Hugh could not remember. All of which seemed to Richard Dalloway awfully odd. For he never gave Clarissa presents, except a bracelet two or three years ago, which had not been a success. She never wore it. It pained him to remember that she never wore it. And as a single spider's thread after wavering here and there attaches itself to the point of a leaf, so Richard's mind, recovering from its lethargy, set now on his wife. That sudden vision of her there at luncheon, of himself and Clarissa, of their life together. And he drew the tray of old jewels towards him, and taking up this brooch, then that ring, he asked, how much is that? But doubted his own taste. He wanted to open the drawing-room door and come in holding out something, a present for Clarissa. Only what? But Hugh was on his legs again. He was unspeakably pompous. Dubonnet, it seemed, was out, and Hugh said he would not buy anything until Monsieur Dubonnet chose to be in, at which the assistant flushed and bowed. It was all perfectly correct, and yet he couldn't have said that to save his life. Why these people stood that damned insolence he could not conceive. Hugh was becoming an intolerable ass. He could not stand more than an hour of his society. And, flicking his bowler hat by way of farewell, Richard turned at the corner of Conduit Street, eager, yes, very eager, to travel that spider's thread of attachment between himself and Clarissa. He would go straight to her in Westminster. But he wanted to come in holding something. Flowers? Yes, flowers, since he did not trust his taste in gold. Any number of flowers, roses, orchids, to celebrate what was really an event. This feeling about her when they spoke of Peter Walsh at luncheon. He had, once upon a time, been jealous of Peter, him and Clarissa, but she had often said that she had been right not to marry him, which, knowing Clarissa, was obviously true. She wanted support, not that she was weak. And they never spoke of it, not for years had they spoken of it, which is the greatest mistake in the world. The time comes when it can't be said, one's too shy to say it. So he set off with his great bunch held against his body to Westminster to say straight out in so many words, holding out flowers, I love you really thinking of the war, and thousands of poor chaps with all their lives before them, now already half forgotten. It was a miracle. Here he was, walking across London, to say to Clarissa in so many words that he loved her, which one never does say. Partly one's lazy, partly one's shy, and Clarissa, it was difficult to think of her except in starts, as at luncheon, when he saw her quite distinctly, saw their whole life quite distinctly. It was a miracle that he should have married Clarissa. He walked across the park to tell his wife that he loved her, for he would say it in so many words when he came into the room. Looking at Buckingham Palace, you can't deny it a certain dignity. Nor despise what does, after all, stand to millions of people as a symbol, absurd though it is. And he liked continuity, the memorial to Queen Victoria. Whom he remembered seeing in Kensington. And the sense of handing on the traditions of the past. It was a great age in which to have lived. Indeed, his own life was a miracle. Make no mistake about it, here he was, in the prime of life, walking to his house in Westminster to tell Clarissa that he loved her. Happiness is this. No, 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 he was not in love with her any more. He only felt after seeing her that morning. Among her scissors and silks, making ready for the party. Unable to get away from the thought of her, she kept coming back and back. Like a sleeper jolting against him in a railway carriage. Which was not being in love, of course. It was thinking of her, criticising her, starting again after thirty years, trying to explain her. The obvious thing to say was she was worldly, cared too much for rank and society and getting on. Which was true in a sense. She had admitted it to him. She was honest, would own up if you took the trouble. What she would say was that she hated frumps, fogies, failures. Like himself, presumably. Thought people had no right to slouch about with their hands in their pockets. Must do something, be something. She held herself upright, never lounged in any sense of the word. She was straight as a dart, a little rigid, in fact. In all this, there was a great deal of Dalloway, of course. With twice his wits, she had to see things through his eyes, the tragedy of married life. She must always be quoting Richard, as if one couldn't know to a tittle what he thought by reading the telegraph each morning. These parties were all for him, or for her idea of him. She made her drawing room a sort of meeting place. She had a genius for it. Over and over again, he had seen her take some raw youth, wake him up, twist him, set him going. Infinite numbers of dull people conglomerated round her, of course. But odd, unexpected people turned up. An artist sometimes, sometimes a writer. And behind it all was that network of visiting, leaving cards, being kind to people, running about with bunches of flowers and little presents. Oddly enough, she was one of the most thoroughgoing sceptics he had ever met. Possibly, she said to herself, as the whole thing is a bad joke, let us, at any rate, do our part. 
mitigate the sufferings of our fellow prisoners, decorate the dungeon with flowers and air cushions, be as decent as we possibly can. The phase came directly after Sylvia's death, that horrible affair, to see your own sister killed by a falling tree before your very eyes, a girl on the verge of life, the most gifted of them, she always said. Those ruffians, the gods, shan't have it all their own way. Later she thought there were no gods, no one was to blame. And so she evolved this atheist religion of doing good for the sake of goodness. And of course she enjoyed life immensely. It was her nature to enjoy, though goodness only knows she had her reserves. It was a mere sketch that even he could make of Clarissa after all these years. Anyhow, there was no bitterness in her, none of that sense of moral virtue which is so repulsive in good women. But she needed people. With the inevitable result, she frittered her time away, lunching, dining, giving these incessant parties, talking nonsense, saying things she didn't mean, blunting the edge of her mind, losing her discrimination. There she would sit at the head of the table, taking infinite pains with some old buffer who might be useful to Dalloway. They knew the most appalling bores in Europe. Or in came Elizabeth, and everything must give way to her. And now Elizabeth was out, presumably laughed at her mother's friends. Thought him an old fogey. Ah well, so be it. The compensation of growing old. Peter Walsh thought, coming out of Regent's Park and holding his hat in hand. Was simply this, that the passions remain as strong as ever, but one has gained, at last, the power which adds the supreme flavour to existence, the power of taking hold of experience, of turning it round, slowly, in the light. A terrible confession it was, but now, at fifty-three, one scarcely needed people any more. Life itself, every moment of it, every drop of it, here, now, in the sun, in Regent's Park, was enough. Too much, indeed. It was impossible that he should ever suffer again as Clarissa had made him suffer. For hours at a time, for hours and days, he never thought of Daisy. Could it be then that he was in love with her? It was a different thing altogether, a much pleasanter thing. The truth being, of course, that she was in love with him. One doesn't want people after fifty. One doesn't want to go on telling women they are pretty. That's what most men of fifty would say. But then these astonishing crevices of emotion, bursting into tears this morning. What was all that about? It was jealousy that was at the bottom of it. Jealousy which survives every other passion of mankind, Peter Walsh thought, holding his pocket knife at arm's length. Daisy said in her last letter she had been meeting Major Ord. Said it on purpose, he knew. Said it to make him jealous. He could see her wrinkling her forehead as she wrote, wondering what she could say to hurt him. And yet it made no difference. He was furious. All this pother of coming to England and seeing lawyers wasn't to marry her, but to prevent her from marrying anybody else. That was what tortured him. That was what came over him when he saw Clarissa so calm, so cold, so intent on her dress or whatever it was, realising what she might have spared him, what she had reduced him to, a whimpering, snivelling old ass. But women, he thought, shutting his pocket knife, don't know what passion is. They don't know the meaning of it to men. There she would sit on the sofa by his side, let him take her hand, give him one kiss. Clarissa was as cold as an icicle. Big Ben was beginning to strike. First the warning, musical, then the hour, irrevocable. Lunch parties waste the entire afternoon, thought Richard Dalloway, approaching his door. With directness and dignity, the clock struck three, and she heard nothing else. But the door handle slipped round, and in came Richard. What a surprise! In came Richard, holding out flowers, roses, red and white. He was holding out flowers, but he could not yet bring himself to say he loved her, not in so many words. But how lovely, she said, taking his flowers. She understood, she understood without his speaking. His Clarissa. She put them in vases on the mantelpiece. She said how lovely they looked. And was it amusing? Had Lady Bruton asked after her? Peter Walsh was back. Must she ask Ellie Henderson to the party? That woman Kilman was upstairs. But let us sit down for five minutes. All the chairs were against the wall. It all looked so empty. Oh, it was for the party. No, he had not forgotten the party. Peter Walsh was back. They were talking about him at lunch, said Richard. He was going to get a divorce and he was in love with some woman out there. Oh, yes. She had him here. Just as he always was. He was at lunch, said Richard. She had met him too. Well, he was getting absolutely intolerable, buying Evelyn necklaces, fatter than ever, an intolerable ass. I might have married Peter. Just as he always was. They had been writing a letter to the Times for Millicent Bruton. That was about all Hugh was fit for. Richard held her hand. Happiness is this. And our dear Miss Kilman, he asked. In a Macintosh with an umbrella. Clarissa thought the roses absolutely lovely. Kilman arrives just as we've done lunch. Elizabeth turns pink. They shut themselves up. I suppose they're praying. He didn't like it, but these things pass over if you let them. He had not said, I love you, but he held her hand. Happiness is this. This. But why should I ask all the dull women in London to my parties? Poor Ellie Henderson. But Richard had no notion of the look of a room. Did she wish she had married Peter? If she worried about these parties, he would not let her give them. But he must go. He must be off, he said, getting up. 
He stood for a moment as if he were about to say something. The roses looked lovely. Some committee? Armenians. Or perhaps it was Albanians. She watched him open the door. There is a dignity in people, a solitude even between husband and wife, a gulf. And one must respect it, for one would not part with it oneself, or take it from one's husband against his will, without losing one's independence, one's self-respect. Something, after all, priceless. He returned with a pillow and a quilt. An hour's complete rest after luncheon, he said. And he went. How like him. He would go on saying, an hour's complete rest after luncheon to the end of time, because a doctor ordered it once. It was like him to take what doctors said literally, part of his divine simplicity, which made him go and do the thing while she and Peter frittered the time away bickering. He was already halfway to the House of Commons, to his Armenians, while she settled on the sofa looking at his roses. And people would say, Clarissa Dalloway is spoiled. She cared much more for her roses than for the Armenians. Hunted out of existence, maimed, frozen, victims of cruelty and justice. She had heard Richard say so again and again. No, she could feel nothing for the Albanians. But Richard was already at the House of Commons, at his committee, having settled all her difficulties. Alas, no, that was not true. He did not see the reasons against asking Ellie Henderson. She would do it, of course, as he wished. Since he had brought the pillows, she would lie down. But why, why did she suddenly feel, for no reason that she could discover, desperately unhappy? She went through one thing and another. No, it was not. It came back to her. Sally Seaton saying Richard would never be in the cabinet because he had a second-class brain. No, she did not mind that. Nor was it to do with Elizabeth and Doris Kilman either. It was a feeling, some unpleasant feeling, earlier in the day, perhaps something Peter had said. Combined with some depression of her own in her bedroom, taking off her hat. And what Richard had said added to it. But what did he say? Her parties, that was it. Her parties? Both of them criticised her very unfairly, laughed at her unjustly for her parties. That was it. Now that she knew what it was, she felt perfectly happy. They thought, or Peter at any rate, that she enjoyed imposing herself, liked to have famous people about great names. In short, was simply a snob. Well, Peter might think so. Richard merely thought it foolish of her to like excitement when it was bad for her heart. And both were quite wrong. What she liked was simply life. That's what I do it for, she said, speaking aloud to life. But suppose Peter said to her, yes, yes, but your parties, what's the sense of your parties? All she could say was, and nobody could be expected to understand, they're an offering which sounded horribly vague. She could not imagine Peter or Richard taking the trouble for no reason whatever to give a party. Could any man understand what she meant? He was so-and-so in South Kensington, someone up in Bayswater and somebody else in Mayfair, and she felt quite continuously a sense of their existence, and she felt what a waste, what a pity, if only they could be brought together, so she did. And it was an offering to combine, to create. But to whom? An offering for the sake of offering. Perhaps. Anyhow, it was her gift. Nothing else had she of the slightest importance. Could not think, write, even play the piano. She muddled Armenians and Turks, loved success, hated discomfort, must be liked, talked oceans of nonsense, and to this day asked her what the equator was and she did not know. All the same, that one day should follow another, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that one should wake up in the morning, see the sky, walk in the park, meet Hugh Whitbread, then suddenly in came Peter, then these roses. It was enough. After that, how unbelievable death was. That it must end, and no one in the whole world would know how she had loved it all, how every instant... The door opened. Elizabeth knew her mother was resting. She came in very quietly. As a child, she had a perfect sense of humour, but now at 17, why, Clarissa could not in the least understand, she had become very serious. She stood quite still and looked at her mother, but the door was ajar and outside it was Miss Kilman. Miss Kilman in her Macintosh, listening. Yes, stood on the landing and wearing a Macintosh. She had her reasons for that. First, it was cheap. Second, she was over 40 and did not dress to please. Moreover, she was poor. Otherwise, she would not be taking jobs from people like the Dalloways, from rich people who liked to be kind. Mr. Dalloway, to do him justice, had been. Mrs. Dalloway had not. She had been merely condescending. Elizabeth said she had forgotten her gloves. That was because she could not bear to see them together. They hated each other. But Doris Kilman did not hate Mrs. Dalloway. She had seen the light two years and three months ago. Now she did not envy women like Clarissa Dalloway. She pitied them. Their lives were a tissue of vanity and deceit. You who have known neither sorrow nor pleasure, who have trifled your life away. But if only she could make her weep, could ruin her, humiliate her, bring her to her knees, crying, You are right. But this was God's will. It was to be a religious victory. So she glared, so she glowered. Clarissa was really shocked. This a Christian, this woman, who had taken her daughter from her. 
she in touch with invisible presences. You are taking Elizabeth to the stores, Mrs Dalloway said. Miss Kilman said she was. They stood there. Miss Kilman was not going to make herself agreeable. She had always earned her living. Her knowledge of modern history was thorough in the extreme. Here was Elizabeth, rather out of breath. Odd it was, as Miss Kilman stood there, how second by second the idea of her diminished. How hatred, which was for ideas, not people, crumbled. How she lost her malignity, her size, became second by second merely Miss Kilman in a Macintosh. Whom heaven knows Clarissa would have liked to help. At this dwindling of the monster, Clarissa laughed. Saying goodbye, she laughed. Off they went together, Miss Kilman and Elizabeth. And out of the window she watched the old lady opposite climbing upstairs. Let her climb up if she wanted to, let her stop, then let her gain her bedroom, part her curtains, as Clarissa had often seen, then disappear again into the background. How extraordinary it was, strange, yes, touching, to see the old lady, they had been neighbours ever so many years, move away from the window, as if she were attached to that sound, that string. Gigantic as it was, it had something to do with her. Somehow one respected that, this old woman looking out the window, quite unconscious she was being watched. There was something solemn in it. Love and religion would destroy that, whatever it was, the privacy of the soul. The odious Kilman would destroy it, yet it was a sight that made her want to cry. Doris Kilman had, as a matter of fact, very nearly burst into tears when Clarissa Dalloway laughed at her. When people are happy, she had told Elizabeth, they have a reserve upon which to draw, whereas she was like a wheel without a tyre, jolted by every pebble. Clarissa went back into the drawing room. Love and religion, how detestable they are. Had she ever tried to convert anyone herself? Did she not wish everybody merely to be themselves? Clarissa had a theory in those days. They had heaps of theories, as young people have. It was to explain the feeling they had of dissatisfaction, not knowing people, not being known. It was unsatisfactory how little one knew people. For how could they know each other? You met every day, then not for six months or years. But she said, sitting on the bus going up Shaftesby Avenue, she felt herself everywhere. Not here, 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 as she wrapped the back of the seat, but everywhere. She waved her hand, going up Shaftesby Avenue, said she was all this, so that to know her, or anyone, one must seek out the places who completed them, and the people. Odd affinities she had with people she had never spoken to. Some woman in the street, some man behind a counter, even trees, even barns. It ended in a transcendental theory which, with her horror of death, allowed her to believe, or say that she believed, that since our apparitions, the part of us which appears, are so momentary compared with the other unseen part of us, which spreads wide, the unseen might survive, be recovered somehow attached to this person or that, or even haunting certain places after death. Perhaps, perhaps. Looking back over that friendship of almost thirty years, her theory worked to this extent. Brief, broken, often painful as their actual meetings had been, the effect of them on his life was immeasurable. There was a mystery about it. You were given a sharp, acute, uncomfortable grain, the actual meeting, horribly painful as often as not, yet in absence, in the most unlikely places, it would open, flower out, let you touch, get the whole feel of it. Sometimes, after years of lying lost, came an understanding. Thus she had come to him, on board ship, in the Himalayas, suggested by the oddest things. She had influenced him more than any person he had ever known. He saw her most often in the country, not in London, one scene after another at Borton. He had reached his hotel. He crossed the hall. He might go to Clarissa's party, or he might go to one of the halls, or he might settle in and read an absorbing book written by a man he used to know at Oxford. He got his key off the hook. The young lady handed him some letters. He went upstairs. Oh, it was a letter from her. This blue envelope, that was her hand, and he would have to read it. He was another of those meetings, bound to be painful. To read it needed the devil of an effort. How heavenly it was to see him, she must tell him that. That was all. But it upset him, annoyed him. He wished she hadn't. Coming on top of his thoughts, it was a nudge in the ribs. He folded the paper, pushed it away. Nothing would induce him to read it again. Why couldn't she let him be? After all, she had married Dalloway and lived with him in perfect happiness all these years. Who was Peter to make out that life was all plain sailing? Peter always in love, always in love with the wrong woman. What's your love, she might say to him. And she knew the answer. How it was the most important thing in the world and no woman possibly understood it. To get that letter to him by six o'clock, she must have sat down and written it directly he left her. Stamped it, sent somebody to the post. It was, as people say, very like her. She was upset by his visit. She had felt a great deal, had for a moment when she kissed his hand, regretted, envied him even, remembered. He saw her look it. Something he had said. How they would change the world if she married him. Whereas it was middle age, it was mediocrity. Then with her indomitable vitality she had forced herself with triumphant power to put all that aside. Yes, but there would come a reaction after he left. She would be frightfully sorry for him. 
She would think what in the world she could do to give him pleasure. Short of always the one thing. And he could see her with the tears running down her cheeks, going to her writing table and dashing off that one line which she was to find greeting him. Heavenly to see you. And she meant it. Peter Walsh had now unlaced his boots. But it would not have been a success, their marriage. The other thing, after all, came so much more naturally. It was odd, it was true. Lots of people felt it. Peter Walsh, who had done just respectably, filled posts adequately, was liked, but thought a little cranky, gave himself airs. It was odd that he should have had, especially now that his hair was grey, a contented look, a look of having reserves. It was this that made him attractive to women. They liked the sense that he was not altogether manly. There was something unusual about him, or behind him. It might be that he was bookish, never came to see you without taking up the book on the table. Always reading, his bootlaces trailing on the floor. Or that he was a gentleman, which showed itself in the way he knocked the ashes out of his pipe, and in his manners to women, of course. Yet it was quite ridiculous how easily some girl without a grain of sense could twist him round her finger. But at her own risk. That is to say, though he might be ever so easy, and indeed with his gaiety and good breeding fascinating to be with, it was only up to a point. He wouldn't stand this, he saw through that. He was a man. Just not the sort of man one had to respect. Which was a mercy, not like Major Simmons, for instance. Not in the least like that, Daisy thought, when in spite of her two small children, she used to compare them. He pulled off his boots, he emptied his pockets. Out came with his pocket knife a snapshot of Daisy on the veranda. Daisy, all in white, with a fox terrier on her knee. Very charming, very dark, the best he had ever seen her. Look at the women he loved. Vulgar, trivial, commonplace. This was a man, charming, clever, with ideas about everything. If you wanted to know about Pope, say, or Addison, or just to talk nonsense, what people were like, what things meant, Peter knew better than anyone. It became more and more difficult for him to concentrate. Clarissa had sapped something in him permanently. It was he who had lent her books, he who had helped her. Look at him in love. He came to see her after all these years, and what did he talk about? Himself. It did come so much more naturally than Clarissa. No fuss, no bother, no finicking and fidgeting. All plain sailing and the dark, adorably pretty creature on the veranda exclaimed, Of course, of course, she would give him everything. He could hear her saying it. She had no discretion. Everything he wanted, she cried, running to meet him, whoever might be looking. And she was only twenty-four, and she had two children. Well, indeed, he had got himself into a mess at his age, and it came over him when he woke in the night pretty forcibly. Suppose they did marry. For him it would be all very well. But what about her? She must settle for herself, judge for herself. He never knew what people thought. But where was his knife, his watch, his seals, his notecase? And Clarissa's letter, which he would not read again, but liked to think of. And Daisy's photograph. And now for dinner. He would go to Clarissa's party. He would go because he wanted to ask Richard what they were doing in India, the conservative duffers, and what's being acted, and music. Oh yes, and mere gossip. Since it was a very hot night, wicker chairs were placed on the hotel steps, and there sat gentlemen. Sipping, smoking, detached gentlemen sat. The great revolution of Mr Willett's summertime had taken place since his last visit to England. The prolonged evening was new to him. It was enlivening. The young people went by with their dispatch boxes, awfully glad to be free, proud of stepping this famous pavement. Perhaps their joy was cheap, tinsely if you like, but all the same rapture flushed their faces. They dressed well too, pink stockings, pretty shoes. They would now have two hours at the pictures. It sharpened, it refined them. He was astonished by the beauty. It was encouraging too, for where the returned Anglo-Indian by right sat in the Oriental Club, biliously summing up the ruin of the world, here was he, as young as ever, envying young people their summertime and the rest of it. He felt for a copper to buy a paper and read about Surrey in Yorkshire. He had held out that copper millions of times. Surrey was all out once more. This interminable life. But cricket was no mere game. Cricket was important. He could never help reading about it. He read the scores in the stop press first, then how it was a hot day, then about a murder case. And the supreme mystery which Kilman might say she had solved, or Peter might say he had solved, but Clarissa didn't believe either of them had the ghost of an idea of solving, was simply this. Here was one room, there another. Did religion solve that, or love? Having done things millions of times enriched them, though it might be said to take the surface off. The past enriched, and experience. And having cared for one or two people, and so having acquired the power which the young lack, of cutting short, doing what one likes, not caring a rap what people say, and coming and going without any very great expectations, which, however, was not altogether true of him. Not tonight, for here he was starting to go to a party, at his age, with the belief upon him that he was about to have an experience. But what?
is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. How delightful to see you, Clarissa said it to everyone. She was at her worst, effusive and insincere. It was a great mistake to have come. He should have stayed at home and read his book, gone to a music hall. He knew no one. Oh dear, it was going to be a failure, a complete failure. Clarissa felt it in her bones as dear Lord Lexham stood there apologising for his wife who had caught cold at the palace garden party. She could see Peter out of the tail of her eye criticising her. Why, after all, did she do these things? Why seek pinnacles and stand drenched in fire? It was idiotic. Incredible how Peter put her into these states just by coming and standing in a corner. But why did he come? Merely to criticise. Why always take, never give? Why not risk one's little point of view? There he was wandering off and she must speak to him, but she would not get the chance. Life was that. Humiliation, renunciation. What Lord Lexham was saying was that his wife would not wear her furs at the garden party because, my dear, you ladies are all alike. Lady Lexham being 75 at least. It was delicious how they petted each other, that old couple. She did like old Lord Lexham. She did think it mattered her party and it made her feel quite sick to know that it was all falling flat going wrong. Anything, any explosion, any horror was better than people wandering aimlessly. Standing in a corner like Ellie Henderson, not even caring to hold themselves upright. Ellie Henderson didn't so much mind not having anyone to talk to, for she felt that they were all such interesting people to watch. It was an event to her, going to a party. Just to see the lovely clothes was a treat. Well, Ellie, and how's the world treating you? Said Richard, and Ellie Henderson, getting nervous, flushing, feeling it was incredibly nice of him to come and talk to her, said that many people really felt the heat more than the cold. Yes, they do, said Richard Dalloway. Yes. The curtain blew out again and Clarissa saw. She saw Ralph Lyon beat it back and go on talking. So it wasn't a failure after all. It had begun. But it was still touch and go. She must stand there for the present. People came in a rush. She had six or seven words with each. They went on, into the rooms, into something, not nothing, since Ralph Lyon had beaten back the curtain. And yet for her own part it was too much of an effort. She was not enjoying it. It was too much like being just anybody standing there. Anybody could do it. Yet this anybody she did a little admire. Couldn't help feeling that she had anyhow made this happen. Every time she gave a party she had this feeling of being something not herself, and that everyone was unreal in one way. Much more real in another. It was, she thought, the clothes being taken out of their ordinary ways, the background. It was possible to say things you couldn't say anyhow else, things that needed an effort, possible to go much deeper. But not for her, not yet, anyhow. How delightful to see you, she said. Dear old Sir Harry. He would know everyone. And what was so odd about it was the sense one had as they came up the stairs, one after another, Mrs Mount and Celia, Herbert Ainsty, Mrs Dacres, oh, and Lady Bruton. How awfully good of you to come, she said. And she meant it. It was odd how standing there one felt them going on. What name? Lady Rossiter? But who on earth was Lady Rossiter? Clarissa! That voice. It was Sally Seaton. Sally! After all these years, she loomed through a mist, older, happier, less lovely. Embarrassed, laughing, words tumbled out. Passing through London, heard from Clara Hayden. What a chance of seeing you. So I thrust myself in without an invitation. Sally Seaton beneath this roof. She hadn't looked like this when the idea had engulfed her. The luster had gone from her skin. Yet it was extraordinary to see her again. They kissed each other, this cheek, then that, by the drawing-room door, and Clarissa turned with Sally's hand in hers and saw her rooms full. Heard the roar of voices, saw the candlesticks, the blowing curtains. And the roses. I have five enormous boys. I can't believe it. But alas, the hostess was wanted, reclaimed from frivolity by the name in the air. The Prime Minister. Ellie Henderson marvelled. What a thing to tell Edith. He looked so ordinary. One couldn't laugh at him. You might have stood behind him at a counter and bought biscuits. To be fair, he did his rounds very well. It was amusing. Him trying to look somebody, nobody looking at him, going on talking. Yet it was perfectly plain that they all knew, felt this majesty in passing, this symbol of what they all stood for. Lord, the snobbery of the English, thought Peter Walsh, standing in the corner. That must be, by Jove it was, Hugh Whitbread, grown fatter, whiter, snuffing round the precincts of the great. He looked always as if he were on duty, hoarding secrets which he would die to defend though it was only some piece of tittle-tattle dropped by a court footman, which would anyway be in the papers by tomorrow. And now Clarissa escorted her Prime Minister down the room, prancing, sparkling, with the stateliness of her grey hair. She wore earrings in a silver-green mermaid's dress. Age had brushed her. There was a breath of tenderness, her woodenness, severity, prudery, all worn through now, and she had about her an exquisite cordiality, as if she wished the whole world well. But he was not in love. The Prime Minister had been good to come. 
and walking down the room with him, with Sally and Peter there, and Richard very pleased, she had felt that intoxication of the moment. Dear old Peter, thinking her so brilliant, felt it tingle and sting. There was a hollowness. It might be that she was growing old, but it satisfied her no longer as it used. There was her old friend, Sir Harry. Dear Sir Harry, she said, going up to the fine old fellow who had produced more bad pictures than any other two members of the Royal Academy. What are you laughing at? For Willie Titcombe and Sir Harry and Herbert Ainsty were all laughing. But Sir Harry could not tell Clarissa Dalloway his stories of the music hall stage. Much though he liked her. Of her type, he thought her perfect, and threatened to paint her. He chaffed her about her party. He missed his brandy. These circles, he said, were above him. But he liked her, respected her, in spite of her damnable upper-class refinement, which made it impossible to ask her to sit on his knee. Up came that wandering will-o'-the-wisp old Mrs. Hilbury. They won't tell us their stories. Dear Clarissa, exclaimed Mrs. Hilbury. She looked tonight, she said, so like her mother when she once saw her walking in a grey hat in a garden. And really Clarissa's eyes filled with tears. Her mother walking in a garden. But alas, she must go. For there was Professor Brierley, who lectured on Milton, talking to Jim Hutton. Who was unable even for a party like this to compass both tie and waistcoat or make his hair lie flat. And even at this distance she could see they were quarrelling. For Professor Brierley was a very queer fish. She interrupted. She said she loved Bach. So did Hutton. That was the bond between them. Hutton. A very bad poet. Always felt that Mrs. Dalloway was far the best of the great ladies who took an interest in art. She made her house so nice if it weren't for her professors. She had half a mind to snatch him off and set him down at the piano in the back room, for he played divinely. But the noise, she said, the noise. The sign of a successful party. Then, nodding urbanely, the professor walked off. He knows everything in the whole world about Milton, said Clarissa. Does he indeed, said Hutton. Who would imitate the professor throughout Hampstead, the professor on Milton, on moderation, the professor nodding urbanely. Alas, she must leave him. There was old Miss Parry, her aunt. For Aunt Helena was not dead. People who had known Burma in the 70s were always led up to her. Where was Peter Walsh? They used to be such friends. Come and talk to Aunt Helena about Burma. And yet he had not had a word with her all the evening. We will talk later, said Clarissa, leading him up to Aunt Helena in her white shawl with her stick. This is Peter Walsh. That meant nothing. He has been in Burma. But she must speak to that couple, said Clarissa, Lord Gayton and Nancy Blow. Was that Lady Bruton? Is that Peter Walsh grown grey? It was old Miss Parry, certainly, the old aunt who used to be so cross when she stayed at Borton. Never should she forget running along the passage naked and being sent for by Miss Parry. No doubt it was forgotten now, she told Peter, her book on the orchids of Burma, but it went into three editions before 1870. Clarissa! Oh, Clarissa! Sally caught her by the arm. Clarissa stopped beside her. He heard once again what Charles Darwin had said about her little book on the orchids of Burma. But I can't stay. I shall come later. Wait. She said, looking at Sally. She must wait, she meant, until all these people had gone. They must wait. And she looked back at her old friends, Sally and Peter, who were shaking hands, and Sally, remembering the past, no doubt, was laughing. Her eyes were not aglow as they used to be. Old women in the village never to this day forget to ask after... Your friend in the red cloak, who seemed so bright. Clarissa used to think she was bound for some awful tragedy. She remembered having to persuade her not to denounce Hugh Whitbread at family prayers, which she was quite capable of doing with her daring. Instead of which she had married, quite unexpectedly, a bald man with a large buttonhole, it was said, owned cotton mills at Manchester. She and Peter settled down together. They were talking. They would discuss the past. A part of this Sally must always be, and Peter must always be. But she must leave them. There were the Bradshaws, whom she disliked. Lady Bradshaw, the typical successful man's wife. And Sir William, who looked very distinguished. Why did the sight of him talking to Richard curl her up? He looked what he was, a great doctor. Think what cases came before him. People in the uttermost depths of misery, on the verge of insanity, questions of appalling difficulty. Yet, what she felt was, one wouldn't like Sir William to see one unhappy. No... Not that man. How is your son at Eden, she asked Lady Bradshaw. Clarissa looked at Sir William. He was talking to Richard. He had just missed his eleven, said Lady Bradshaw, because of the mumps. His father minded even more than he did, being nothing but a great boy himself. She did not know what it was about Sir William, what exactly she disliked. She had once gone with someone to ask his advice. He had been perfectly right, extremely sensible. But heavens, what a relief to get out to the street again. Lady Bradshaw murmured how... Just as we were starting, my husband was called upon the telephone. A very sad case. A young man. That is what Sir William is telling Mr Dalloway, too. He had been in the army. He had been in the trenches. A young man had killed himself. Oh, his death in the middle of my party. She went on into the little room where the Prime Minister had gone with Lady Bruton. Perhaps there was somebody there, but there was nobody. What business had the Bradshaws to talk of death at her party? A young man had killed himself. He had thrown himself from a window. Up had flashed the ground, through him, blundering, bruising, went the rusty spikes. 
There he lay with a thud, thud, thud in his brain, a suffocation of blackness. So she saw it. But why had he done it? And the Bradshaws talked of it at her party, then. She had felt it only this morning. There was the terror, the overwhelming incapacity, one's parents giving it into one's hands, this life to be lived to the end, to be walked with serenely. There was in the depths of her heart an awful fear. Even now, quite often, if Richard hadn't been there reading the Times, she might have perished. He had been looking at her as he stood talking to the Bradshaws and thought to himself, who is that lovely girl? And suddenly he realised that it was Elizabeth. He had not recognised her. She looked so lovely in her pink frock. It was due to Richard. She had never been so happy. Nothing could be slow enough. Nothing lasts too long. No pleasure could equal, she thought. This having done with the triumphs of youth. Lost herself in the process of living, to find it with a shock of delight as the sun rose, as the day sank. She walked to the window. Many a time she had gone at Borton when they were all talking to look at the sky, or seen it between people's shoulders at dinner, seen it in London when she could not sleep. She parted the curtains. She looked. It held, foolish as the idea was, something of her own in it. This country sky. This sky above Westminster. It will be a solemn sky, she had thought. A dusky sky, turning away its cheek in beauty. But there it was, ashen pale, raced over quickly by tapering vast clouds. It was new to her. The clock began striking. The young man had killed himself. Oh, but how surprising. In the room opposite, the old lady stared straight at her. She was going to bed. It was fascinating to watch her moving about, that old lady crossing the room, coming to the window. Could she see her? It was fascinating, with people still laughing and shouting in the drawing room, to watch that old woman quite quietly going to bed. And the sky, it will be a solemn sky, but there it was, ashen pale, raced over quickly by tapering vast clouds. It was new to her. The wind must have risen. She was going to bed in the room opposite. She pulled the blind now. The clock began striking. The young man had killed himself. But she did not pity him. With the clock striking the hour, one, two, three, she did not pity him. With all this going on... The words came to her. There, the old lady had put out her light. The whole house was dark now with this going on, she repeated, and the words came to her. Fear no more the heat of the sun. What an extraordinary night. She felt somehow very like him, the young man who had killed himself. They went on living. She would have to go back. The rooms were still crowded. People kept on coming. All day she had been thinking of Borton, of Sally, of Peter. They would grow old. But he had flung it away. Death was defiance. There was an embrace in it. She felt glad that he had done it, thrown it away. The clock was striking. The leaden circles dissolved in the air. He made her feel the beauty, made her feel the fun. But she must go back. She must find Sally and Peter. And she came in from the little room. But where is Clarissa? He was sitting on the sofa with Sally. After all these years, he really could not call her Lady Rossiter. Where's the woman gone to? There were people of importance, politicians, whom neither of the pair of them knew unless by sight from the picture papers. People Clarissa had to be nice to, had to talk to. Yet there was Richard Dalloway, not in the cabinet. He hadn't been a success, Sally supposed. She scarcely read serious papers. She sometimes saw his name mentioned. She had been that afternoon to see her sons at Eton, where they had the mumps. Lord, what a change had come over her. The softness of motherhood. It's egotism, too. There was his old trick, always opening and shutting a knife when he got excited. Last time they met had been among cauliflowers in the moonlight. She had marched him up and down that awful night. They had been very intimate, very, very, she and Peter Walsh, when he had been in love with Clarissa. She had marched him up and down that awful night, after the scene by the fountain. And he had gone off to India, and she had heard vaguely he made an unhappy marriage. Last time they met had been among cauliflowers. She didn't know whether he had children, and she couldn't ask him, for he had changed. He was to catch the midnight train. Heavens, he had wept. He was rather shriveled looking but kinder. She had a real affection for him, and she still had a little Emily Bronte he had given her. And he was to write, surely, in those days he was to write. Have you written? she asked him, spreading her hand, her firm and shapely hand, on her knee. Not a word, said Peter Walsh. And she laughed. She was still attractive, still a personage, Sally Seaton. I hear you have myriads of servants, miles of conservatories. Sally owned it with a shout of laughter. She said she had ten thousand a year, whether before or after tax, he couldn't remember. Ask her husband. Whom you must meet, whom you would like. You, who used to be in rags and tatters, who pawned her grandmother's ring to come to Borton. Oh yes, going to Borton always meant some frightful pinch. But it had meant so much. So unhappy had she been at home. That was all a thing of the past, all over now. She felt that Peter was an old friend, a real friend. Did absence matter? Did distance matter? She had owed Clarissa an enormous amount, but... Did Peter understand? She lacked something. What was it? She had charm, extraordinary charm, but to be frank... She had often wanted to write to him, but tore it up, yet felt he understood. 
for people to understand without things being said. To be quite frank, how could Clarissa have done it? As one realises, growing old, married Richard Dalloway, and old she was, a man who cared only for dogs, who came into the room smelling of the stables entirely literally. And then all this, she waved her hand, Hubert bred it was, strolling past, blind for everything except self-esteem and comfort. He's not going to recognise us. What does he do now? Blacks the king's boots or counts bottles at Windsor. Peter kept his sharp tongue still. But you must be frank, that kiss now. Hughes? On the lips, in the smoking room one evening. I went straight to Clarissa in a rage. Hugh didn't do such things, the admirable Hugh. Remember Hugh's socks, without exception the most beautiful ever seen. And now his evening dress. And has he children? Everybody in the room has six sons at Eton, except me. No daughters, too. No wife. Well, you look younger than any of them. And you don't seem to mind. But to marry like that was a silly thing to do, in many ways. A perfect goose she was. We had a splendid time of it, at times. <laughs> How could that be, Sally wondered. It must be galling for him. It must be lonely at his age to have no home, nowhere to go to. He must stay with them for weeks and weeks. Of course he would. He would love to stay with them. And that was how it came out. All these years, the Dalloways had never been the once. Time after time, they had been asked. It was Clarissa, of course. Clarissa would not come. For, said Sally, Clarissa was at heart a snob. One had to admit it. Clarissa thought she had married beneath her, her husband being, she was proud of it, a miner's son. A snob, was she? Yes, in many ways. Where was she all this time? It was getting late. You spend weeks and weeks planning a party, and then they seem to end almost before they begin. Who was that? That lady standing by the curtain all evening, not speaking. Davidson? Was that her name? That is Ellie Henderson. Oh, yes. She was a cousin, very poor. <laughs> Clarissa was really very hard on her. She was, rather. Yet, said Sally in her emotional way, How at night, or on Christmas Day, with a rush of that enthusiasm which she used to love her for, yet now dreaded a little, so effusive she might become, when she counted up her blessings, she put their friendship first. How generous to her friends Clarissa was. They were young, that was it. Clarissa was pure-hearted, that was it. Peter would think her sentimental. So she was. For she had come to feel that it was the only thing worth saying, what one felt. I do not know what to feel. Cleverness is silly. One must say simply what one feels. But Sally, I do not know what I feel. Poor Peter, she thought. Why did not Clarissa come and talk to them? That was what he was longing for. All the time he was thinking only of Clarissa, fidgeting with his knife. He had not found life simple, he said. His relations with Clarissa had not been simple. It had spoiled his life, he said. They had been so intimate, he and Sally. It was absurd not to say it. One could not be in love twice, he said. And what could she say? Still, it is better to have loved. But he would think her sentimental. He used to be so sharp. He must come and stay with them in Manchester. That is all very true, he said. All very true. He would love to come and stay with them. And Clarissa had cared for him more than she had ever cared for Richard. Sally should not have said that. She went too far. No, 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 said Peter. That good fellow. There he was, at the end of the room, holding forth, same as ever. Dear old Richard. Who is he talking to? I don't know, but I don't like his looks. Probably a cabinet minister. Of them all, Richard seems the best, the most disinterested. But what has he done? Public work, she supposed. And were they happy together? Sally asked. For what can one know even of the people one lives with each day? She had read a wonderful play about a man who scratched on the wall of his cell, and she had felt that was true of life, one scratched on the wall. Are we not all prisoners? Despairing of human relationships, she often went into her garden. To find peace which men and women never give. Well, I don't like cauliflowers. I prefer human beings. Indeed, Sally said. The young are beautiful. But these two, these two coming now, what could one know about people like that? That they're damn humbugs, said Peter, looking at the Bradshaws casually. He made Sally laugh. When one is young, one is much too excited to know people. Now that one is old... Fifty-two, to be precise. Sally was fifty-five in body, she said, but her heart was like a girl's of twenty. Now one can watch, one can understand, and one does not lose the power of feeling. That is true. Every year she felt more deeply, more passionately. There was someone in India, he said. He would like to tell Sally about her. He would like Sally to know her. She was married. She had two small children. They must all come to Manchester, said Sally. He must promise before they left. There's Elizabeth. She feels not half what we feel, not yet. But, said Sally, watching Elizabeth go to her father. One can see they are devoted to each other. She could feel it by the way Elizabeth went to her father. Even Ellie Henderson was going, nearly last of all, though no one had spoken to her, but she had wanted to see everything, to tell Edith. And Richard and Elizabeth were rather glad it was over. He had not meant to tell her, but he could not help it. He had looked at her, he said, and he had wondered, who is that lovely girl? And it was his daughter. Richard was proud of his daughter. That did make her happy. You were right. Richard has improved. I shall go and talk to him. I shall say good night. What does the brain matter, said Lady Rossiter, getting up, compared with the heart? I will come said Peter, but he sat on for a moment. What is this terror? What is this ecstasy? What is it that fills me with extraordinary excitement? It is Clarissa, he said. She was striking. Beautiful. It is Clarissa. For there she was. For there she was. For there she was. For there she was. 